by the power of God. Amen. Well, welcome to our new series. And uh, I just want to just echo that. Thank you for uh, those of you that participated in the blood drive. Any of you here uh, gave blood yesterday here at Pearlside? I saw a bunch of you. There you guys are. Yeah, there you go. Uh, we're probably going to do another blood drive um, sometime soon, so stay tuned for that. Um, it only hurts for a little while. The most pain was the finger prick. I didn't, I didn't know that they were going to. I hate when you poke my finger. That's just the worst. But then, you know, it's just like 20 minutes and then hopefully save three lives. So we want to just continue to be a blessing because, as you know, uh, the crisis of 2020 is not ended yet. Uh, there's still, we're still going through it, and who knows what el- whatever life is going to throw at us next. But here's what we do know. We're going to continue to journey through this year with faith. Amen. And whatever crises uh, the enemy throws at us, we're going to thrive because that's what God's word calls his church to do. Not just get by, not just survive, but to thrive. And we do that as we stay connected to him and we stay full of faith. Amen. So, so thank you guys for being a part of that. And we're looking forward to, to even more. And I thought it was kind of funny, you know, on, on Halloween, uh, we gave blood. Amen. I mean, Blood on Halloween, it's just kind of funny. And, and then we also gave candy, right? So it's like blood sugar, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know how it works out. And, uh, and 700 pounds of candy is a lot of candy. And so I, I know uh, Landon here with a dentist, uh, you, you had some issues with that, right? Like we're, hurting, we're, we're saving lives and we're hurting lives at the same time. It's just, anyway, if you didn't know candy was bad for you, I'm sorry to break that to you right now. But anyway, um, but you know, we want to redeem Halloween and, and make it about God. Amen. All right. Well, as we said, we're starting a brand new series entitled No Matter What. And the reason why this is so important is because no matter what goes on in our lives, we need to be reminded that God is in control. Can I hear an amen to that? That no matter what is going on in our situations, in our circumstances, no matter what's going on that's outside of our control, we need to be reminded that God is in control. And in order to thrive the way that God's called us to thrive, in order to, to live the lives that he's called us to live and to fulfill the purpose that God has placed on the earth for us to fulfill, we need to remember that God is in control. Because if we forget that God is in control, a lot of bad things can happen. And we can make decisions and choices in the midst of crisis that can lead us away from the purpose of God and down a dark path. And so we want to begin this series tonight with a message entitled Providence. And what the word providence means is it describes God's activity in the world. Providence describes what God does from his sovereign place in heaven on earth. And it reminds us that even though things seem to be going a certain way, God is in control and he's doing something behind the scenes that we can't yet discern or tell. And as we stay faithful and as we follow him, we'll begin to see God's purpose play out. It's like the song that we just sang, right? Even even when I can't see it, you're working. That's providence. Even when I can't feel it, you're working. And you never stop. You never stop working. God is always working behind the scenes. And so for us as believers, our job is to learn to trust and obey God in the midst of the crisis that's going on, trusting in his providence. And so we want to unpack this a little bit tonight, because again, if we're going to thrive in the crises of life, which unfortunately are many and ongoing, we need to learn to trust in God's providence. Can I hear an amen to that? Psalm 75 is where we're going to be tonight, because it describes this whole thing and, and helps us to understand what is our role or what is our place? What do we do in the face of God's providence? He says, the psalmist says this in Psalm 75, starting in verse 2, This is God speaking. I chose the appointed time. It is I who judge with equity. When the earth and all its people quake, it is I who hold its pillars firm. To the arrogant, I say, boast no more. And to the wicked, do not lift up your horns. And the horns in in ancient days represented power and authority. So don't exalt yourself. Lift up your horns, right? Do not lift your horns against heaven or do not speak so defiantly. No one from the east or from the west or from the desert can exalt themselves. It is God who judges. He brings one down and he exalts another. Verse 9, as for me, I will declare this forever. I will sing praise to the God of Jacob who says, I will cut off the the horns of the wicked and the horns of the righteous will be lifted up. Let's pray as we begin tonight. Father, we thank you for your word. It reminds us in many, many, many places that no matter what's going on in the world outside, no matter even what's going on in, on the inside of us, God, you are in control. And you're calling us to trust you at greater and greater uh, levels. You're calling us to trust you in greater ways in our lives that we might experience your providence and see what you're doing uh, in and through all of our lives, God. We open up our hearts to you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. But this passage in the Bible is teaching here um, in your notes and on screen says this, no matter what, God is sovereignly in control. No matter what, God is sovereignly in control. 
that principle needs to be the foundation stone of everything that we do in our lives. It needs to be a foundational principle of every decision that we make and every action that we take that no matter what, God is sovereignly in control, meaning he's in heaven reigning and ruling, and he's going to work things out according to his purpose. Now, not everything that happens on the earth is exactly what God intends it to be because he's given human beings free choice. And with that free choice, we often do things that break God's law, that sin against one another and hurt one another. Just about every case of evil that you see on the planet is the result of human beings at some choice and at some level making choices to go against God's word and bringing evil upon ourselves. It could be argued that the coronavirus is the result of human beings and evil, right? Whether you believe China cooked it up in a lab or just covered it up so it spread across the earth. Either way, it is the source of, it is the result of human human choice and human evil. Even re- re- rewinding all the way back into the Garden of Eden, the Bible is very clear that evil came as the result of human beings choosing to re- reject God. And so not everything that happens on the earth is exactly as God intends it to be. However, God is always working behind the scenes. God is always working on the other side of the mountain in ways that sometimes we can't see and we'll find out later on. But he's always working even in the midst of human depravity and human evil and human bad choices to bring about his purpose. The question is not, is God working? The question is, are we going to be faithful and obedient to God so that we will reap the result of God's desired, of the God's desired plan? Are you following what I'm saying? Because sometimes you can get, get, get a little off on this. Say, well, if God's sovereignly in control, then everything that happens is God's choice, right? A person dies in a car crash. Well, God, God must have killed that person. No, we have to understand that God didn't cause that drunk driver to drink and then get behind the wheel of the car. That was his own or her own stupid decision that caused that accident to happen. You follow what I'm saying? But yet behind the scenes, God is at work. So a lot of people make the mistake and they go, well, if God is real, then there shouldn't be evil on the planet. Well, the problem with that logic is that in order for there to be no evil whatsoever, he, he would have had to rob every single one of us of free will and the decision to choose. And that is not in God's nature because you can't have a relationship with someone that doesn't have, a, a, you know, have free choice. Isn't that true? If I could wave a wand and if we, before we got married, wave a wand over my wife and make her fall in love with me, you know, I thought about that. I would, I would do that. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be nice. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, you have no choice, right? Or my kids, I have three kids. If I could wave a magic wand over them and make them do everything I tell them to do, that would be pretty nice, actually. Especially today. <laughs> it was a rough day. Anyway, you know, just, just wave a magic wand. You, you have no choice. You have to love me. That would be nice for a little while. But after a while, you realize that is empty. It's not real. They don't, they don't actually love me. They are robots and they have no choice. God could have created a world where we don't have a choice. But he's not like that. He's loving. He himself is relationship, right? And so he, he chose to give us that choice knowing that evil could result. But yet the potential for deep love and intimacy and real relationship is also a possibility as well. See, the question is not, is God working? The question is, will we choose to trust in him and follow him and experience his love and his goodness on the earth? But behind the scenes, God is in control. And he's working history out towards his desired end. The book of Revelation tells us how this all ends. And I don't have the time to unpack that here for you tonight. But it ends with Jesus sitting on the throne, reigning and ruling, and all who've chosen to follow him, living an eternal life with him forever. That's how this ends. And God is working history out in that direction. It's sometimes it's hard to see, especially when we live in a time like we live in right now. Coronavirus, lockdowns, economic challenges, now a presidential election that's looming and it's tearing the country apart in different ways, right? And we just wonder, God, what are you doing behind the scenes? I wish I knew the answer to that. I wish we could know everything that God is doing and how he's working things out. We have suspicions. We may think certain things, but what we need to rest in and what we should rest in is even though I can't see it, he's working, right? Even though I can't feel it, he's working. And somehow, some way, God's going to work this out. The only question is, whose side am I going to be on? Am I going to be on God's side, or am I going to reject him and be on the other side of this? Because the Bible is also very clear that while all who choose Jesus are going to have eternal life in heaven, the Bible is also clear that all who reject Jesus are not going to experience that eternal life with God in heaven, but be in the other place called hell. And so the Bible is very clear. Our choice or our issue is to choose God. It's not even Republicans versus Democrats. Is are you on God's side? You say, well, whose side? Who's on God's side? I'm, I, that's between you and the Lord to figure that out. The issue is, am I trusting in the Lord? Am I following him? Am I doing my best to seek him and his heart? No matter what, God is sovereignly in control. And our job is to choose to trust in him. Look what it says back in verse 2. I choose the appointed time. It is I who judge with equity. 
God is working behind the scenes. He's, he's causing things to happen in such a way that his purpose is played out on the earth. And this is so important because no matter what happens or whatever happens, come whenever the results of the election come out, <laughs> uh, there's going to be a lot of people that's disappointed. Isn't that true? If you're for Biden, you're going to be disappointed if Trump wins. If you're for Trump, you're going to be disappointed that Biden wins, right? However this plays out, there's going to be a large percentage of the population that's going to be very disappointed in what happens on the earth over the next few weeks. Isn't that true, right? But here's what we have to remember. God is going to work no matter what behind the scenes, no matter what happens on the earth. A great example of this, and we, we spent some time on this in our, in our last series, the book of Daniel tells about how the nation of Israel was attacked by the Babylonians. And, and the reason why that happened is because the nation of Israel had rejected God. And as judgment, God raised up a wicked king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. The Bible actually says that he raised Nebuchadnezzar up for this purpose to bring judgment onto Israel for their sins. Think about that for just a moment. God used the wicked ruler to do his, fulfill his purpose against his people because they persisted in disobeying him. Does God sometimes do that? I think he does. But here's, what, here's the other thing that the Bible is very clear about. Even though Nebuchadnezzar was a wicked, ungodly king, worse than Trump, worse than Biden, no matter whatever you think of either one, he was worse than all of them. But yet God broke into that person's heart. And through the ministry of guys like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we find King Nebuchadnezzar coming to his knees and repenting before God. Furthermore, we see three other kings, King Cyrus and King Darius and King Belteshazzar, all come to encounter the presence of God, even though they, they themselves have rejected God. And at the very end of it, God used King Darius of Persia to, to send the Israelites back to Israel to rebuild, to, to, to go back home. Can God use ungodly, wicked rulers for his purpose? He absolutely can. Has he done it before? Yes. Will he do it again? I believe he will. So whoever wins on Tuesday or whenever we find out who wins, God ultimately wins. Amen. And God will ultimately work things out for his purpose. The question for us is not can God work and will God work? The question is will we trust in him so that we will see his purpose play out in our lives? Because here's what the Bible also says. Whatever happens in the White House may affect your life, but you know what affects our lives even more than what happens in the White House is what happens in my house and what happens in, in your house and how you and I obey this word will determine how we live and how God blesses or doesn't bless our lives. And we can get all caught up in what's happening outside. And, and I'm not saying ignore those things and, and be ignorant and all that. Definitely not. But what I am saying is we need to trust God for what happens there, do our civic duties. But we need to be, make sure that we're doing the right thing and we're being faithful by our God. Amen? Because he sees how, you, how we live. And he either raises up, as it says in this word, and he pulls down those that he desires. And so we need to make sure that we are staying faithful and obedient to him no matter what happens. But, but that should be a bit of an encouragement to us, shouldn't it? Because a lot of people are getting bent out of shape right now and concerned and fearful and maybe rightfully so in certain respects. But I believe that there is a God in heaven who's going to work this all out. And whatever happens is not going to be the end of the world. God is going to use whatever happens for his purpose. My job, your job, our job is to stay faithful to him and to follow him no matter what. Can I hear an amen to that? Turn to your neighbor and tell him, follow him no matter what. <clears throat> the reason why I say that there's a lot of people that are just losing their minds, as you know, and we just got to make sure we stay faithful to God. We got to stay faithful to God and trust in our God. The second thing this passage tells us, verse 3, when the earth and all its people quake, there's a lot of quaking going on, shaking, quaking. People are fearful. People are nervous. People are anxious. Look what it says. It is I who hold its pillars firm. It is I, the Lord, who holds the earth and its pillars firm. God is the one holding the earth together. And we need to remember that he's the one that stabilizes the earth. He is the one that stabilizes our lives. And over the last how many months of this coronavirus pandemic, I've begun to notice uh, certain patterns. Those that have trusted in the Lord and remain faithful to his word, God's been taking care of you. God's been taking care of you. Even if those that have lost their jobs, man, those that have been faithful to, to God and his word, God's been providing in miraculous, amazing ways. He's stabilizing people's lives. People have been trusting God, have seen their marriages healthy, even thrive during this season. Their families strong and getting even stronger during this season. But here's what I've also observed, and this is just my observation as a minister. People that haven't been obedient to God, people that don't really trust God, they're shaking and they're quaking. And things are falling apart because it's the Lord that holds it together. See, a lot of times we think, man, I, I got this. I can hold this together on my own. But then the Lord allows shaking to happen. 
And I think part of the reason is to show us that we actually can't hold our lives together on our own. We think we can, but then things happen that are outside of our control. But then we see people trusting in the Lord and God providing for them and blessing them. I, I have a couple of people that, that have both lost jobs. And um, this, this one family almost lost both of their jobs, the husband and the wife. The husband was almost going to get furloughed. He said he was going to get furloughed. The wife lost her job. So they were freaking out, um, sort of freaking out. But, they, but here's, here's, here's what their confession was. We're trusting in the Lord. We keep tithing. And the Bible's promise is he's going to provide for us. Isn't that what we teach, right? If, we, if we're faithful, God's going to provide. And so I'm watching this happen. And at the same time, I'm watching another, another family. They've never trusted God with a tithe. I'm not, not judging, okay? But it's just, it's just an observation, true fact. And to this day, still haven't gotten that job. There still hasn't, God still hasn't shown up and provided. We need to stay faithful to God, right? And the family that, has, that had been faithful to God the whole time, man, God, didn't, the, the husband didn't get furloughed and the wife got a job like two weeks after losing hers. I mean, and there's, there's still other people that have been, haven't gotten their jobs yet and it's been months. Now, is that a perfect formula? No, it's not. But I think God's word is true. When we trust him and we're faithful, he holds it together. And he wants us to learn that at the end of the day, when we trust in God, man, he's faithful to us, to those that are faithful to him. And if you're here today and you're, you're going, man, I, I know I haven't been faithful, Pastor. Listen, don't feel con- condemned at all. The church isn't a place that you should ever feel judged or condemned by God. It's a place where we can be challenged and encouraged. Trust in him because God wants to show himself faithful to you. Amen. God wants to show himself faithful to you so that when you, when you talk to people that don't believe in God, you say, you'll, ne- you'll never believe it, man. God provided this. He did that. He did this. And we get to show the glory of the Lord to our friends and our neighbors as well. God is the ultimate stabilizer. During this coronavirus pandemic and all these things, I mean, you've probably seen the, 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 the stories, but alcohol sales are up 300%. 300%. People don't have enough money to buy food, but they're spending money on alcohol. Why is that? Because it medicates us. It helps take away the pain and the stress and the anxiety of what's going on. Rather than looking to God to stabilize us, we're looking to substances to stabilize us. Drug abuse has gone up as well. Sex trafficking is up. Why, why is that? People are looking for ways to escape. And so the demand, unfortunately, for that type of evil is going up as well. The, the demand for psychotropic medication has gone way up. Domestic abuse has gone way up. Divorce has gone way up. Basically, every negative metric in society has gone way up. Why is that? Because the earth is shaking, right? Our lives are shaking. And rather than looking to other things to find comfort, we, we need to be looking to the Lord. Because he wants to be that source of strength and comfort to every single one of our lives. Reach out to him no matter what. The third thing that we see here from this passage He goes on in verse 4, To the arrogant I say, boast no more. And to the wicked, do not lift up your horns or lift up your own strength and your own arrogance. Do not lift your horns against heaven. Do not speak so defiantly. He instructs us to avoid arrogance and to embrace humility. Embrace humility. How do we respond to God's providence? Is to come before him humbly. God, I recognize that I am not ultimately in control of my life. I recognize that I can't control what the government does or what the viruses do or all these things that, are, that have controlled every aspect of our lives. God, I am not in control. And I look to you and I trust you. Rather than boasting in my own strength, right, the horns, rather than boasting in my own might and my own ability, I'm looking to you, God. And the question that I have for us tonight is, what are we trusting in? Our own ability to get by and to survive and to make things happen? Or are we looking to God? Because there's there's a saying that I've heard, God will allow, God will shake and allow things to be shaken so that we realize that the only thing that cannot be shaken is God himself. Sometimes God allows things to be shaken in our lives so that we realize the only thing that is sure is him. And maybe that's why the shaking's been going on, to bring us back to faith in Jesus, to bring us back as a nation to trusting in God and praying to God, as you'll see in a moment, what our nation was founded upon. And we've drifted so far from that. Could it be what we're going through right now is to bring us back to that place? Could it be what you're going through and what I'm going through is to to bring us back to that place of fully trusting in God with humility? Scripture tells us in James 4 that God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. God opposes the proud. So if we come to God proud and thinking that we got it all together, the Bible says he will actually oppose you. I don't know about you. I don't want God to oppose me. I, I, you, right? I mean, I don't know. Maybe you do. I, I certainly don't want God to oppose me. And so I need to come humbly before him. 
You know what brings humility more than anything else? When your life is shaken, right? When, when we don't have control. And maybe part of the reason why this is happening, God's allowed it to happen, is so that we realize, I need him. And maybe you're here tonight because you're realizing God is he's allowed some shaking to go on because you need him. Maybe that's why you're here. And I've got good news for you. If we come before him humbly, he doesn't oppose us. If we just come before him humbly, here's what he does. He opens his, his arms and he embraces us and brings us in. He doesn't oppose those who come with, to him with humility. So if you're here tonight and you're saying, man, I'm, I'm, I've, I'm experiencing some shaking. Guess what? There's a God in heaven who's willing to embrace you. He's waiting to embrace you and to strengthen you. God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. If my people, Second Chronicles says, who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. When we come before God humbly, the Bible tells us he's willing to heal, bring healing to our land. And maybe part of what we're going through is to bring us to this place of humility. Fourth thing that we see from this passage in verse 6. No one from the east or from the west or from the desert can exalt themselves. It is God who judges. He brings one down and he exalts another. God promotes and demotes for his purpose and for his justice. Whoever wins the election on Tuesday is who God wants to be in office for this season, for, this, for, for whatever reason, right? Remember, God raised up wicked Nebuchadnezzar to bring judgment on Israel for a reason. You may not like it. and A lot of people didn't like it. But God had a purpose behind it. So our job, whatever happens with these elections on Tuesday, whatever happens with the mayoral elections and the senatorial elections, whatever, our job is to look to him, to look to God, not to a person, not to a man, not to a woman, but to look to God. He has a plan. He has a purpose. And we need to trust in him. Look, no one from the east or the west or from the desert can exalt themselves. No one can exalt themselves. It is God who judges. He brings one down and he exalts another. This is so important, too, because we need to trust that God is going to be the ultimate judge. He's going to be the ultimate judge. There's a lot of people, I'm sure you've seen it, that, you know, depending on how the elections turn out, there's people promising we're going to start some riots, right? We're going to burn some stuff down. How many of you know that that's not a biblical response when you don't get your, get your way? I don't care what you think about whatever cause they're standing for. That's not what you do when you don't get your way. And that's not what you do in a, in a representative democracy, neither, right? But... There's something inside of us that if we're not trusting in God, then we have to take matters into our own hands. We have to take matters into our own hands and make things happen the way that I want them to happen. And can I tell you that you're, you're not going to get the blessing of God by violating the word of God, right? Thou shalt not burn down thy neighbor's business. I mean, it should, it's pretty much in there, right? Do not kill, do not, you know, all that kind of deal. Listen, you're not going to bring about the blessing of God by doing things that go against or contradict the word of God, Right? If, if we're out there insulting people and cursing at people or attacking people, that's not going to bring about the blessing of God. I don't care what you say. If things don't turn out the way that we want, we still need to be Christians. Amen? If things don't turn out the way that we want, we still need to be civil to one another and love one another. Amen? And so I, I got people, two guys in, my, or guys in my small group, one, some guys that are for Biden, some guys that are for Trump. And, uh, but here's the awesome thing. We, they disagree on the way things ought to turn out, but here's what we do agree on. We're going to live according to this word as best as we can. And I love it. We can love one another. We can forgive one another. We can have healthy discussions about things, but we're not going to sin in the process. And that's so, so important. And no matter what, we're still children of God, and we need to act like it. Can I hear an amen to that? So if you're out there burning down a business, don't tell me you come to ProSide, okay? Um, <laughs> you will be disavowed. Um, it's not cool. I mean, does anyone disagree with that? All right. God promotes and demotes. I don't answer that question. <clears throat> God, it is God who judges. He brings down and he exalts another. Our, our job is to trust in him and to look to him. No matter what, we need to continue to act faithfully and to act faithfully to this word. And God, in the end, will have his way. You know, I, I don't know if many of you know this, but you know, one of the arguably the most famous presidents of all time in the United States is Abraham Lincoln. And uh, a good book, if you want to read about Abraham Lincoln, is, is a book written by um, author, historian, New York Times bestselling author, author Stephen Mansfield. And he writes a book, Lincoln's Battle with God. Um, Stephen used to come here and speak all the time. I've had the privilege of sitting with him many times and just learning from uh, this guy. But he writes a book, Lincoln's Battle with God. And one of the things that very few people know about Abraham Lincoln is before he uh, came into office, he actually was a self-proclaimed atheist. 
His mom was a, was a hardcore Christian, taught him the Ten Commandments and the memorized Bible verses. But, you know, sometimes when you have an overbearing mother that's trying to shove religion down your throat, you reject it just a little bit. Well, Abraham Lincoln rejected it a lot, actually. And, and he resisted God. He didn't really want to have anything to do with God and church. And when he got into office, though, things began to change. God began to work on his heart. And his faith grew um, progressively from his time working in the White House and, and serving as the President of the United States. So much so... That, that he did some very some, some significant things while in office that seemed like he was a Christian at the time, which is why a lot of people thought, man, this guy must have been a Christian his whole life. No, in reality, according to letters that he wrote and friends that he had said, no, this, this dude is, this dude is uh, pretty far from it. However, during the height of the Civil War, he put out a general order to the entire military, and I think we have a picture of it, um, basically declaring, is that it? There you go. Declaring or, or, or commanding all of the soldiers and of the Union Army to observe the Sabbath. In other words, you cannot go out into battle and fight on a Sunday. There's a story where, where uh, one of his generals said, you know, we have the advantage. If we attack the, the, the rebel positions uh, on, on this day, uh, we can take them. And Abraham Lincoln looked at the thing. He said, but that's on a Sunday. And he ordered the general to stand down because we're going to honor God on the Sunday. And if you, and I, wanna, I want you to take a look at that on screen. Look, look at what he says, the very last sentence. I know you can't read it, so I'll read it for you. <laughs> you can't read that? No, really? What's wrong? No. Uh, I'll read to you what he said. The general hopes and trusts that every officer and man will endeavor to live and act as becomes a Christian soldier, defending the dearest rights and liberties of his country. He wasn't even a Christian at this time. He didn't become a Christian until a little bit later, but there was enough faith in him and people around him that his faith started to grow while he was in office, such that he said, you know what? We need to honor God, and one of the ways that we can honor God is by obeying the Sabbath. It's one of the Ten Commandments. Now, I don't know about you. If I have an advantage and I can, you know, maybe end the war sooner by attacking on a Sunday, baby, let's go. You know what I'm saying? That's why he's Abraham Lincoln and I'm not, right? Because he chose that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put God first. His faith was growing. Another thing that he did before he became a Christian, arguably, was he signed a proclamation making Thanksgiving a national holiday. Before that, it wasn't a national holiday. Some states had practiced Thanksgiving, but it was really only after Abraham Lincoln that it became uh, a national holiday around the entire nation. Now, I'm going to read more of this to you because I want you to hear what he said about this. He said this, I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November. I love Thanksgiving, by the way. I'm so excited that it's coming. As the day of Thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens. And I recommend to them that while offering up ascriptions justly due to him for such singular deliverances and blessings, that they do also with humble penitence for our national preservedness and diso uh, perverseness and disobedience. You know, he's calling for repentance. He's not just saying give thanks. He's saying he was calling for a national day of repentance for perverseness and disobedience and commend his tender care all those who have become widows, orphans, mourners, or sufferers in this lamentable civil strife in which we are un unavoidably engaged and fervently implore the interposition of the almighty hand to heal the wounds of the nation and to restore it as soon as may be consistent with the divine purposes to the full enjoyment of peace, harmony, tranquility, and union. This, this man was still growing in his faith, and yet God used him to bring about a National Day of Thanksgiving, which in the beginning, it, wasn't, it certainly wasn't about shopping on Black Friday. It was about coming before God, giving thanks for his blessings, and coming to him with repentance for our sins, and really coming before God as the one who holds all things together. Lincoln was growing to understand God's providence and wanted to make sure that he was on the right side of that. As I said, he wasn't yet a Christian until a little bit later. And by his own words, it was November 13th, 1863, after he visited Gettysburg, uh, the site of one of the bloodiest battles in the Civil War. And the day that proved, that this day proved to be the pivot point of Abraham Lincoln's faith. And he said on December 7th, 1864, and I think we have a slide of that. When I left home, this is him recounting things. I requested to my countrymen to pray for me. I was not then a Christian, he said. When my son died, the severest trial of my life, I was not a Christian. But when I went to Gettysburg and looked upon the graves of our dead heroes who had fallen in defense of this, their country, I then and there con consecrated myself to Christ. Yes, I do love Jesus. And this was reported by the Freeport Weekly Journal, December 7th, 1864. He did a lot of things 
even before coming to true faith in Christ. God used him. Even when he was resisting God himself in many different ways, even when he wasn't yet ready to fully follow and trust in Jesus, God was using him. Why am I telling us this here tonight? God can do anything with anyone by his providence. Amen? And so no matter what happens, whether your preferred candidate doesn't make it into office or not, God can work and change that person's heart and bring about his purposes regardless. See, a lot of times, we, you know, there are a lot of Christians who looked at Abraham Lincoln and said, this dude's not a Christian. This dude's not following Jesus. How do we can't have him as our president? But God touched him. He did something. He changed his heart and he, he moved him to do some certain things that, that made a difference. And most notably and most importantly, on January 1st, 1863, Lincoln issued the prelim, prelim, preliminary emancipation proclamation, which was the, st the starting point, which eventually resulted in the passing of the 13th Amendment, ultimately abolishing slavery. God used this man who resisted him for many, many years to bring about his purposes on the earth. Can God work in someone who's not our ideal candidate? Absolutely. Can God work in someone who's wicked and resisting God? Absolutely. He did it in Nebuchadnezzar, in Cyrus, in Darius, in Belshazzar. He did it in Lincoln. I'm not saying Lincoln was wicked, but he wasn't following Jesus. Can he do it now? Absolutely. He did it before. He can do it again. See, our, our issue oftentimes, we get so caught up with the person that we forget that there's a God that's working behind the scenes. Amen. And oftentimes, God's working when we can't see. So we just need to trust. We need to stay faithful. We need to stay obedient. Keep praying. Because by the way, Lincoln had a lot of people praying for him. His mother was a God-fearing woman. She died early on in his life, but she prayed for him fervently. He had people and advisors around him who were praying for him. He had ministers come and talk to him. And God used people to break into Lincoln's heart. One of the most awesome things, I just found this out, um, that uh, one of his reported his last words that he spoke before being assassinated. The war had ended. 13th Amendment had passed. He accomplished all the things that he knew in his heart God wanted him to do. And so he was talking to his wife, Mary Todd, and saying, you know, they were asking, you know, what do you, what do you want to do now? He said, you know, uh, I don't want to go back to Pennsylvania. And, and it's, this is reported that he said, we, we will visit the Holy Land and see the places hallowed by the footsteps of the Savior. There is no place I so much desire to see as Jerusalem. And those were reportedly his last words before being shot by John Wilkes Booth. He never got to see the Holy Land on earth. But when he went to heaven, he got to see the true Holy Land. Amen. The eternal Jerusalem. But I just want you to, in your mind, understand the picture of this man's life. Before he became the president, he wasn't walking with God. If we were to look at him right now, we might go, I don't want this guy to be our president. Maybe you would. I don't know. I don't, didn't study all of his politics in 18 whatever. But maybe the, there are a lot of people that obviously didn't want him to be. It was a hotly contested election. Even his re-election was hotly contested. But yet, God worked in him, changed him, and used him for his purpose. Because I think we'd all agree, the 13th Amendment, abolishing slavery is a good thing. Amen? That was God wanted that to happen. God wanted the war to be ended and then the nation to be healed. I'm pretty sure God wanted Thanksgiving Day to be established. And, and I don't, whatever else... God can use anyone. So no matter what, God is working, right? No matter what, God is doing something behind the scenes. And no matter what, we need to remain faithful and obedient because God is in control. Can I hear an amen to that? And then lastly, this passage that we just read concludes with this. Psalm 75, verse 9. He said, as for me, the psalmist writes, I will declare this forever. I will sing praise to the God of Jacob, who says, I will cut off the horns of the wicked. God will bring down the wicked. In their strength, God will bring them low. But the horns of the righteous will be lifted up. I love this, this line, the first three words, as for me. See, a lot of times we get caught up on what other people are doing. What's that person doing? Or how come those people are getting, you know, it seems like all the wicked people are getting blessed. <laughs> What's going on, right? How come that person, you know, they don't deserve God's blessing, but it seems like they're being blessed. How come things are going the way that they're going? At the end of it all, this has to be our resounding idea. As for me, I will declare this forever. I will sing the praise of God forever. When it comes down to it, at the end of the day, our job is to remain faithful and obedient no matter what. And if we remain faithful and obedient no matter what, God in the end will lift us up. God in the end will lift us up. Doesn't matter what other people are doing. Doesn't matter what the wicked are doing. God says, I will cut them down. But to the righteous, I will lift them up. A lot of times we get so caught up because we see the wicked being lifted up. We see things going the wrong way and we feel like, what about me, God? 
Maybe you're here tonight and you're saying, what about me? How come I'm not being blessed? How come I'm not experiencing breakthrough? Why is it other people seem to have be having things easy? And, and, and what about me? And I think the word of the Lord to us tonight is, what about you? As for you, declare his praise forever. Trust in him and he will lift you up. One of my heroes in our church who just recently went on to be with the Lord was a man by the name of Breen Harimoto. Maybe you've heard of him. He was our, our state senator here uh, in Hawaii out of Pearl City for many years. And Senator Breen Harimoto uh, used to come to our morning service, 915. He used to always sit right about there with his wife and, his, and, and one of his sons. And I had the privilege of, of being a friend of one of his sons. And, and I had the privilege of seeing uh, Senator Breen's faith grow. He started off as a council member uh, doing, you know, things here in Pearl City. And then he ended up in our state senate. And um, according to all reports, man, he was one of the most liked senators in our state senate. Uh, go figure, uh, because politicians don't usually get that type of a reputation. Uh, but he was liked for his humility. He was liked for his kindness. And a lot of people, even though they didn't agree with his politics and his positions, um, it said that, man, they, they felt bad when they disagreed with him because he was so darn nice about it. <laughs> he was so darn kind about his positions. Well, several years ago, uh, he got diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And during his battle with pancreatic cancer, he had to vote on the hotly contested uh, physician-assisted suicide bill that was going through our state legislature. And that was a very contentious thing, and I'm sure all of us in this room have different opinions on that. But Senator Harimoto made the decision based off of his conscience to vote against the physician-assisted suicide bill. He felt that life and death is in the hands of the Lord, and no human being should have the power to take someone else's life. Um, and so he, he stood on that. And um, he got some heat for it, but he stood on his convictions. And um, even when it could have eased his own suffering in his latter days or during his battle with cancer, he decided, no, I need to stand on my principles, not on uh, what would even be uh, beneficial for me. And so better than you hear it from me, I want you to, let's take a look at the screen and revisit his story because it shows me or it reminds me that God raises people up for a purpose and for a reason. And if we'll trust in him, and if we'll look to him, God will use us no matter what. So I want you to take a look at, at this, this clip in remembrance of Senator Breen Harimoto. Check this out. I cannot in good conscience vote to allow physicians to become complicit in their patients' suicide. It is a misplaced sense of compassion to allow doctors to become agents of death. Yeah, you know, God is just so amazing. So I had no intention of, of running for the Senate, but the doors just opened and uh, God put into my heart that that's what I should do. So I ran for the Senate seat and uh, I won. Went to my first Senate session and everything came caving in. And they said I had pancreatic cancer. People just rarely survive. Mr. President, I don't know how many of us sitting here today in this chamber have stared death in the face. I have. You know, God allowed me to get cancer and, and to survive so I could have this, this huge platform here in the Senate to talk about my, not only my faith in God, but the, the message of, of hope that people need to hear. In, in the Senate, we were considering this assisted suicide bill. In June of 2015, I was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And I knew that once pancreatic cancer spreads, it's terminal. I thought my life was over. You know, it was a real trying time. Major surgery got everything cut out from my abdomen. Things got really rough. There was a time when I actually gave up hope. And I actually just cried out to God to take me home. I, I, I just couldn't take it anymore. I eventually came to my senses. I wanted to live. It would be too easy and tempting in a moment of weakness and despair to reach for those pills to end it all. I'm just glad I didn't have those pills because I stared death in the face two years ago and I still face the prospect of the cancer returning. I see very clearly that life is so precious. We should be making laws to give people a sense of hope, not making laws that allow physicians to assist in death. So Mr. President, 
I will be voting no. And it's just a powerful platform that, that the Lord has given me. It was just perfect that I could speak from personal experience about how we need to have that sense of hope in our heart to just keep on going. Once you lose that, that sense of hope, you know, you have nothing. And Senator Breen, would, one of his last words before he left the Senate was he got before everyone and read scripture. And he brought Pastor Norman and others in to pray and to, and to continue to minister. And he was able to be a witness of the gospel to many, many people in our state's government, in the highest levels of our state's government. Open doors for the gospel in many people's hearts. And whatever you believe about euthanasia, put that on the side for a moment. God used this moment in this man's life to allow him to be a witness for the gospel because he was faithful. Even when he himself was struggling with pancreatic cancer that would eventually take him home to be with Jesus, he said, I'm going to remain faithful no matter what. And you know, when we face things that are outside of our control, it's easy for us to say, you know what, I'm just going to push God on the side and I'm just going to do what I think is right in my own flesh. But what I love about Senator Harimoto is every step along the way, he was faithful to Jesus, even up until his last I remember one of our, our, our first food drives here at Pearlside Down. We did it um, back in, was April or, or, or May. He drove through with his wife. He could tell the effects of chemotherapy all over him. And he made sure that he came to be a blessing to other people. And they dropped off a big old box of food. And, and, and that was actually the last time that I saw him before he went home to be with Jesus. But every step of the way, he remained faithful. Why am I making a hero out of him tonight? Is because I think that's a picture of how we walk and live in the midst of a world that we can't control. In the midst of God's providence, we stay faithful. God allows things to happen for a reason so that his, his love will be poured out. And the issue is, will we be faithful? Will we trust him? Will we keep walking with him? Maybe you're here tonight and you're facing tremendous opposition in your life. Can I encourage you? Keep walking with Jesus. Maybe the first step that you need to make tonight is to begin a relationship with Jesus. But whatever the case is, wherever you are, the solution to a world that's broken because of sin is to stay faithful to God. A solution to politics gone crazy in our country is to look to Jesus and to stay faithful to our God. And as we do that, God will raise us up. God will lift us up for the appointed time. And Senator Harimoto lived a whole lot longer than people thought he was going to live. When he first got diagnosed, they gave him months. Well, he ended up living many, many years. He kept serving in the Senate many, many years longer than they thought that he would and was able to be a witness to Jesus for much longer than anyone thought that he would. But then the Lord called him home. You know what? At some point, God's going to call every single one of us home. Until that day, we stay faithful. Amen? And until that day, we trust in him and he will continue to use us until that day comes. And only he knows. We just keep on trusting and we keep on obeying. Amen.